Now we're going to take you for a bit of fun. We're going to take you for fun and for entertainment into the world of gaming. And I think you are going to love what you are going to see on stage. Absolutely the future of where that side of entertainment can go. Please welcome from the phenomenal company behind Pokemon Go, please welcome the founder and CEO of Niantic, John Hankey. Thanks, Thank you, John. Sasha. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be at uh, MWC. Uh, I'm excited to have a chance to talk to you a bit about what's going on at Niantic. It's been, it's been a really big year for us. Uh, and I'll, I also want to share this morning some of our thoughts about the future and augmented reality. Um, to start with a little bit of history, a lot of people know us as a company that spun out of Google a few years ago. But the origin story of Niantic actually goes back quite a bit further than that. For me, it began as a kid. I grew up in a small town in Texas, and I was obsessed with National Geographic and these beautiful maps that you could fold out of the magazine. So that led me through a winding path to starting a company called Keyhole uh, in the early 2000s with some really talented people, including a guy, a guy named Phil Kesslin, who's here. He's the CTO of Niantic, so he co-founded that company with me. We were a small company, but we had a big, audacious vision. The vision was to map the entire world at a level of detail and precision that had never done, been done before. Um, we were acquired by Google during the process of building that product, and we're really fortunate. We were able to realize that vision with the help of a lot of other talented people inside of Google. So we successfully brought the world to your desktop, and then a few years later, we brought the world to the palm of your hand with Google Maps for Mobile. So after the mapping part was done, we kind of turned to the next obvious question, which is you have this amazing service, this unprecedented amount of detail about the planet. What other kinds of things could you build with it? And we got really interested in some of the hardware that we saw coming in the lab, things like wearable devices, early versions of augmented reality. So we started thinking about how could you connect the digital and the physical worlds in new ways. And that was the genesis of Niantic within Google. And we spun out a few years later. Uh, and we started the company with three kind of primary mission goals. The first of those was this idea of exploration. Um, I wanted to build products that could create adventures that I could have together with my family, with my kids. So we have this idea that there's a story, there's an adventure in every neighborhood. And it's just waiting to be discovered. A second principle for us is exercise. Look, we all need a little nudge to get exercise. And when we do, we feel better. It's a fact that in the developed world, the majority of adults, and more importantly, children, do not get the recommended amount of daily exercise. So we're trying to build products to encourage that. And finally, social. And when we talk about social, we're talking about real-world social, so face-to-face, old-fashioned social interaction. We think that's really important. Uh, there's medical evidence that face-to-face -face social interaction is associated with a general sense of happiness and well-being. We are better people when we're interacting with other people face-to-face. -face. So that's a key part of the company as well. We actually put together events that are kind of like music festivals, uh, combined with gaming events. So people come together in the tens of thousands. We've had events of over 100,000 people coming together to play games together. Uh, so it's a really new kind of social interaction. We think we've done pretty well against those goals in terms of exploration. We've seen millions of places discovered by our players in their neighborhoods, photographed and mapped and actually then incorporated into our games. In terms of exercise, we've seen an astounding 23 billion kilometers walked by our players. So we didn't know initially if people would get off the couch and outside to play, but it's been proven that people will do that and they have a lot of fun doing that. And in terms of the social piece, um, that's been a big success. So within the product, we've seen 190 million friend connections made. And perhaps more importantly, last year we had over 3 million people attend these real-world gaming festivals that I was talking about. 
We're probably best known for kind of jump-starting the consumer AR market. Um, our first game, Ingress, is the second most popular AR game in the world. It has 25 million installs. Um, we followed that with Pokemon Go, um, as Sasha mentioned earlier. Uh, continues to set records. We're at a billion installs, roughly over $2 billion in top-line revenue with that product, and it continues to go very strong. And of course, later this year, we're going to launch our next product, Harry Potter Wizards Unite, in conjunction with our partners at Warner Brothers and with J.K. Rowling. And we're very excited about that. All these products are built on a technology platform that we call the Niantic real-world platform. So this is a common set of technologies that power these real-world AR experiences. So that includes the gameplay engine. That is the piece of the technology that allows hundreds of millions of people to play in a game together in a single global game instance. In the old days, um, if you played an online role-playing game, for example, you might get assigned to a server. There would be many different worlds. So this technology lets you have a single instance sharded across many thousands of servers where everybody's in the same environment. There are other pieces to that as well. There's a social component uh, that powers some of the experiences that I mentioned earlier, the mapping, of course, and then advanced AR. So our advanced AR allows our developers to access the power of AR Core and AR Kit, and also to access AR innovations that we're building within Niantic, all within a single common cross-platform API. So this has been our tool set to date. At the end of last year, we announced the Niantic Real World Developer Challenge. It's a million dollar contest for developers to come in and share their ideas and innovations and build new experiences on this technology. I'm super excited about that. I'm excited about unleashing the power of indie developers in this new area. Um, and I'm also excited to see uh, experiences that maybe cross over, cross outside the boundaries of what we might traditionally think of as games. So, you know, we sit at that intersection of gaming and exercise and social and even shopping. So we're encouraging our developers to think broadly about what kind of experiences they could build with this technology. We're going to select the finalists from that contest this year, uh, and we will be um, announcing some results from that um, around the middle of the year this year. So we're here because we're actually really excited about 5G. And we've been forming some partnerships, maybe unusual for a gaming company, but we've been forming some partnerships with some of the leaders in this industry. Uh, we have a partnership with Deutsche Telekom, with S SK Telekom, with Samsung, and uh, we'll be announcing some more. So you might ask yourself reasonably, well, why are these guys excited about 5G? Uh, what, is, what is it about 5G that's relevant to gaming, to AR gaming? Is there some way that that's going to allow the creation of products, for example, that are going to generate real consumer excitement about wanting 5G service and upgrading to 5G handsets? We think there definitely is. The reason being, <clears throat> we're really pushing the boundaries of what we can do on today's networks. Uh, we need 5G to deliver the kinds of experiences that we are imagining. So I'm going to give you three examples of that. Um, the first of those is this idea of the AR cloud. What is the AR cloud? The AR cloud is a kind of mapping. You could think of it as a continuation of the mapping that we did on Maps and Earth back at Google. Uh, but this map is not built for people. It's built for computers. It's built for your phone. It's built for AR glasses. The map allows the computer to know exactly where it is in the world. For the computer to know where it is in the world, we have to photograph and analyze that environment and create an AR map on the cloud and then serve it back to all of the users that want to play a game in that space. That allows people to share the same virtual reality. It lets them share the same holograms, the same positioning. Uh, but the starting point is that map. And it's very, very, um, it's kind of hard on the networks. Uh, 5G is going to make that better. I want to show you a video that kind of demonstrates uh, what that map making process looks like. Um, so it starts with images. And from those images, we extract certain points. Those get processed and aggregated together, and that forms the positioning map through which the computer can know exactly where it is. Once it knows where it is, we can then augment reality with these shared holograms that many people can see 
in a single shared precise location. And importantly, if you come back the next day or the day after, everything is situated exactly as you want it to be. That requires this map. That map requires a great network. And another technology that it leverages is this idea of edge computing, moving some of the compute, some of the storage out to the edge, closer to the users. Why does it matter for this? This kind of information is very naturally geographically sharded. That means that the map for this room is relevant to all of you if you want to do AR here. You don't need the map of downtown Barcelona, much less of Paris or New York. You need a very specific piece of information that can sit at a local cell site where you can access it very quickly. Um, so it's very natural to think about these AR maps sitting at the edge and being served from the edge to users. The second uh, piece of technology I want to talk about in terms of 5G is for these live events that we host. I mentioned that you know, these things are like rock concerts, hundreds of thousands of people aggregating together in a single spot, all using their phone to play a network intensive mobile game. Like what could go wrong? <laughs> uh, we've pushed current 4G networks to their limit and sometimes beyond their limit. Uh, the networks were not meant for this many people in a very tight, uh, geographically compressed location to all be doing network intensive things all at the same time. So what does 5G do about that? Part of the 5G specification is that it allows for actually three orders of magnitude technically, depends on the implementation, but technically uh, the standard allows for three orders of magnitude more connections per square kilometer of physical space. So if we want to build these really compute and network intensive experiences like shared AR, we need the ability for lots of people to come together and, and to share that. And for that, we really need the next level of network. Um, finally, I want to talk about latency. So, you know, the other Achilles heel of augmented reality is latency. Latency, that time it takes from you're requesting a piece of data to it coming back to you. To do good AR, we need latencies that are close to 10 milliseconds. And that would contrast to the 100 milliseconds or so that you can get today, even in a good network situation. Why does it matter so much for AR? If you think about even traditional gaming, which is pretty demanding in and of itself, a game like Fortnite, where you have people on a server competing, um, you can mask some latency. You can actually hide it from the user so that you don't necessarily know that the person you're playing against, they actually pushed the fire button or moved behind the tree 100 or 200 milliseconds ago instead of instantly, because you don't see the other player whenever they're manipulating their input. You just see the result whenever it comes to you. With AR, if we're all having a shared AR experience and there's a hologram, let's say there's a Pokemon in the room and it's moving across the room and we're tracking all the other players in the room and we're seeing what they're doing and how they're interacting with uh, the object, the opponent or the Pokemon. Um, if somebody moves quickly and the server isn't synchronized, you can see that in a very obvious way. So that's a complicated idea. So to make it more clear, we actually built a demo to show you exactly what that experience is like. Um, we call that codename Neon. So this demo is built with our stack, with a Niantic real world platform, with our advanced AR capability in it. And it's been modified here to take advantage of edge computing in, in um, partnership with Deutsche Telekom and Mobile Edge X. Um, so let me show you a short video of that experience. Uh, and then I'll explain a bit more about it. What you're seeing there is real-time, synchronous, multiplayer AR. 
And all the players in that experience are being tracked in real time. Their position is being shared with all the other players with a latency on order of 10 milliseconds. All their actions, firing, dodging, dodging, absorbing energy, all of that is also being shared with all the other players at a very low level of latency. Uh, so this is a demonstration of the kinds of AR experiences that we can build with our technology and with the advantage of mobile uh, edge computing. Um, this is a preview of what we're going to be able to do on 5G networks as they roll out. So the demo on stage, it's nice to see a video, but we believe that experiencing is believing. So we actually made this demo available to all of you. So this is a demo that you can actually experience and play for yourself and get a little glimpse of the future in the Deutsche Telekom booth. So I hope you will all stop by and try that. You'll be trying it, by the way, uh, on Samsung's latest uh, Galaxy 10 Plus uh, 5G-ready handsets. So it's a really fun experience, and I hope you'll try it. So to close, uh, we think we're at the very beginning of something quite important. The future is one where the world and many, perhaps all of the experiences we have in the physical world are going to be augmented with digital interactions, interfaces, information, and yes, of course, entertainment. So I think this is a pretty big deal. Yes, it's been hyped, but this is one of those paradigm changes that happens maybe once a decade, uh, maybe once every couple of decades. I lived through the rise of the microcomputer in my youth, um, I was at Google and saw the rise of the cloud, and we participated in the rise of mobile with Android and iPhone. And I think the transition to AR and this idea of ubiquitous computing is that kind of a transition. So we at Niantic are very excited to be building the very, very first pieces of that transition today. Thank you. John, thank you so much. Uh, we were just chatting just beforehand. Thank, thank you. you.